Welcome to the PH Journals podcast, where we explore hunting, wildlife management, and conservation. As hunters and conservationists, we know that hunting can be a powerful tool for wildlife conservation, generating revenue and promoting healthy ecosystems. Join us as we explore the latest research, interviewing experts and practitioners, and sharing stories from the field. Whether you're a hunter or conservationist, or simply interested in learning more about this somewhat controversial topic. Hi, my name is Dylan Love. I'm a professional hunter out of the southern tip of the dark continent. Join us as I believe hunting is our best conservation tool we have to offer. Okay guys, welcome back. And yet, like mentioned before, we are running a couple part series here with Splitting Image Team, Doug, welcome. Thank you again. Good to be back. Thanks so much. <laughs> for joining me. Um, guys, this is an interesting one, interesting topic for us to discuss today, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, it's probably, yet again, like I said, taxidermy is probably one of the most important aspects in professional and outfitters' side of work and for the safari. Um, but when it comes down to the nuts and bolts of things, trophy prep is key. And Doug, I would like you to start us off and, and run us through some of the tips and tricks that you've learned to kick off trophy prep. So what sort of tools and um, gear that we can kit our trackers out to make sure that they've got the best tools available for, for the job. Fantastic. Um, yeah, thanks very much. And from, an, from the artistic side of things, if we get clean canvas, we can do clean work, mm. you know. Um, and we've seen every possible way of skinning an animal, some more creative than others. Um, good knives, mm. it's a standard. Um, investing from, a, from the, the African outfitter's perspective, our advice is always invest well in your trackers and skinners' knives. Um, I know that the knives are expensive, mm. I get it. It's more expensive to replace a trophy, I promise. So. Remember that that trophy represents more than skin and bone to your hunter. It's the experience and the time spent with you in the field, harvesting that trophy, chasing after it, working for it. That's the experience. And it can be ruined very quickly if the skinner that is in charge of skinning that animal doesn't have the correct tools. So spend the money on good quality blades. Um, Haviland knives in the States are fantastic. They work really well. You need to be careful around eyelids, around lips, and around ears with a Haviland. They tend to be a bit too sharp. Um, that's just from my opinion. Okay. I like something where you, uh, it's a bit harder to push the blade through the skin that easily. Um, Victrinox pairing knives are fantastic. Really, really good. Um, they hold hold a, a, an edge really well. They resharpen well, which means they've got longevity. Mm. If, you, if the skinners and trackers look after their, their knives, you can comfortably get through 10 to 15 good safaris on a set of knives. Um, obviously, you need something to, to work, work the meat, something to take off the actual, actual skull from the neck, um, so a slightly heavier blade over there, and then maybe a, a light pairing blade that you can get in and out of the face, ears, nose, eyes. Um, and by all means, have a, a Haviland or um, mm. a surgical blade fit on knife um, that you can use for the finer details. Um, so yeah, rule book 101, good quality knives. Um, invest, yeah. invest in the tools because that's probably where the job starts getting really, really technical. 100%. But Doug, I, want, I wanted to... Um, <clears throat> we've seen we've seen in the industry uh, that a lot of outfitters have actually started welcoming guests or clients, whatever however you want to call them, into the country. At I think what COVID's taught us is that you can kind of come out to South Africa any time of the year now. Mm -hmm. So, especially in my personal experience, we've we've seen a lot of clients coming out um, in the warmer months from shot. To when that animal gets into the shed, how important, especially, you know, between the two seasons, hot months and colder months, how important is it for us to get those animals gutted into the cooler or skin off into the salt as quickly as possible 
Um, and if we can't, if we can't, what, what, what advice would you give to us around that sort of period in the warmer months specifically? So I think, I think the, the key is treat every month as a warm month. Hmm. You treat every month as a warm month, you set a standard, you're always going to win. Okay. Okay. So whether it's, it's winter or not, don't think that because it's winter that, hey, you know what, I can take my time a bit longer here. But put a bit of urgency into it. Mm. Let's get these things skinned, cleaned off, and into clean, fresh salt. Again, an expense. I understand that. But there is a pre field preparation fee that is charged to the clients. That should be allocated to making sure that the salt is new and it's the right kind of salt. Hot weather and our game, we, the, the African species have a thinner hair follicle, quite straight hair. Um, unfortunately, it is more prone to shedding after the shot. Mm -hmm. So this is not hair slip, it's shedding. So immediately, once that animal hits the ground, there's a percentage of the animal's body hair that will naturally start to shed and fall off. Kudu, it, it's, a, mm. it's, it's a common comment that, hey, my kudu had more hair. Mm. But there was a lot of hair in between the hair that was already loose, and in the cleaning process and in the salting process, that hair gets washed off. Mm. So as soon as you can skin that animal and get it into clean salt, the better. So let's say you shoot it way out there and you can't. Get the gut out. Mm. I would recommend getting it out as fast as possible. Try and carry a 25 litre drum of cold water in the back of your truck. Um, or water for that matter, it doesn't, it doesn't stay cold for very long. Mm. Use the water to wet the skin up and then cover the trophy in a hessian sack or preferably something that doesn't sweat but that does keep it out the sun. That's the reason I say let's look at something like a hessian um, or a flannel. You do have the tarpaulins that we carry, the carry sails that the guys use. They can be used for the shorter journeys, but if you're going to be out there for a long time, uh, a nice addition is a, a hessian that you can continuously wet and it keeps the skin nice and moist. If, however, you, you really aren't going to get back to camp soon, take the time to set up a gantry Skin it off up until the back of the head. Rinse it with the water from that drum that you've got. You should have an empty drum in your truck as well and salt in your truck at all times as well as a backup. Roll your skin into salt, put it into the drum, close it up with your hessian and off you go. When you get back to camp later, you can then finish off the process, taking the head out, cleaning it, rinsing it off, dripping it and putting it in, into a into a clean salt bed. Also, you wouldn't maybe recommend us hanging it in a tree or something and on the way back no, passing it? No, I wouldn't. Why? Because you're now hanging this skin out and you haven't given it the advantage of having salt in it. Mm -hmm. Salt is your friend. It's your best friend. That and when you come back and a hyena is chewing on the bottom of your cape, I don't want to sew up the holes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's, that makes sense. But so, Doug, talking about salt, um, how often should we say it's a 10 day safari, they shoot an animal on the first day? How, how often should those skins be resalted throughout that safari? It's not necessary to resalt them. If you're using new salt at the beginning of the safari, okay. that salt absorbs more than enough blood. I just wouldn't use that same salt on the next safari. Yeah. I'd rotate it out and use new salt. Okay. I think it's worth the investment. Finer, coarser salt, or not super fine. That very, very fine salt. It gets it saturates too quickly. Not the heavy grain salt. It doesn't saturate at all. You're looking for that medium grain, non iodized salt. Okay, and then Doug, as far as I've seen, I mean, we've been chatting about bad habits and stuff. In the industry alone, what is expected from a client's point of view? as far as field prep is from a professional hunter or the alpha who is ever supplying skinners or um, I've seen a lot of guys skin up until the back of the head and then they throw it in a deep freeze for their, with their clients for, <laughs> and then they leave it up to you guys to finish off the job. From a client, what should they be expecting 
from the outfitter and the professional hunter on treating their trophy. So when they arrive here in South Africa, they can walk up to the skinning sheds or wherever it may be, and they can have a look and actually see and point out if their job's getting done properly. Okay, so from, if, if I put my, myself into the client's shoes, I've invested a lot of money to get here. Mm. Look for clean salt. Mm. Look for good knives. Make sure that the environment in which the, the skins are being salted in is covered. I'm not saying it has to be covered all around. Quite a few of the, the really good skinny sheds are open on the sides with like a, a shade cloth or a mesh, but there's a roof on top. Um, from a security perspective, you don't want to leave the skins out in the open that they're exposed to rodents, stray dogs. Just, let's look after the yeah, investment. Yeah. I treat every trophy as an investment, so mm. let's look after them. Um, the client can spend the time going to check on the skins with the pH. If a client shows interest in how the skins, the animals are being skinned, invariably the pH spends more time with the skinner and the tracker ensuring that it's done properly. Set the standard. Yeah. It's important. Yeah. I say this from the artist's perspective as well because, like I said in the beginning, clean canvas, clean product. Mm -hmm. So it is in our best interest to get a well-caped, well-salted animal because then we're able to produce beautiful taxidermy work that lasts a lot longer. Yeah. And then from, I mean, we've spoken a lot about skins. What, what is the process for, for cleaning and, and what, what do you guys as a taxidermy expect from, from the professional hunters as far as the skulls are concerned? Is there anything that we can do to make your guys' life a lot easier? Than what Absolutely. Fasten the tags to the skulls and skins properly. I want to know who that skull belongs to and who that skin belongs to. If the tags are not put in place properly, we can't guess who they belong to. Mm. It's that easy. Um, PHs have a wonderful ability to look at trophies on our walls and it always amazes me. They'll walk past a trophy and go, hmm, I hunted that with Bob. Mm. I'm going, but you can't see the tag. He says, no, I know that animal. Yeah. And it's awesome. I, I have the world of respect for professional hunters because they truly know the animals incredibly well. Mm. But when it comes to us collecting the trophy, we're not familiar with the trophy's hunt details. So put a good tag on it. We do supply tags to every outfitter that we do taxidermy work for their clients. We give the tags away by the thousand because it's very important to us that we don't get a trophy coming in that isn't tagged correctly. That, uh, I remember in PH school we, we learned about boiling skulls and all. I think that's sort of fallen away. If I'm not mis you wouldn't recommend us no, getting involved. I'd in rather that. you don't. We're not professional enough. To <laughs> you know what it is? It, it, look at it like this. So you guys, the, 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 the guys hunt the trophies in the camp. You just bomb them in the, the good old-fashioned pot and you boil them. Mm -hmm. The fellow doing the boiling often doesn't concentrate, he makes the fires too hot, he overboils the skull. We pick the skull up and then we need to clean it. We need to go through a boiling process to reduce the fat levels. Now you're getting a more brittle bone because it's the second time it's being boiled. If that trophy is going to be exported as dip and pack to another taxidermist, when that taxidermist gets it, then he boils it again to bleach it. That's three times you've boiled and bleached that skull. Mm -hmm. By now it's as brittle as toilet paper. We pick up the trophies, meat on. All we do ask is that the unessential meats are removed. Brains, eyes, all the rest. And then if needs be, and you can, stack it into a bin of salt. That means that you don't get flies coming in. Mm. It works really, really well. Doug, getting into the tagging system, um, the tags are, what I've realized in the past, is have become an intricate part of the the whole process absolutely because how how important and, and from again once again from a client's perspective what, what can they look out and be involved in the process because I, I often see a lot of guys get to the lodge they head off and they go and grab a bite to eat or grab a beer from the bar and stuff and they neglect that part and a lot of professional hunters slip up over there mm. and I, I know it shouldn't be a common problem but it has it, no, it, it is a common problem in it so from a client's perspective, what can they do to get a little bit more involved in there? Just make sure that that sort of stuff is getting tagged properly. Do they physically go and check it themselves or, or would you recommend them writing the tags out from their side? I've seen that happen quite a few few times. That can happen. It goes back to, we had a, a conversation at, in a, 
in another another podcast we did. If I recall, we spoke about um, administration. Yeah. Tags are administration. It's admin. It's work. Yeah. Um, firstly, make sure that you spell the client's name correctly on the tag. I know that it's a pain because you've got a tag for the skull, a tag for the left horn, tag for the right horn, and you've got a tag for the skin, and so then you've got a tag for the both back. Horns. Well, sometimes the guys do. Even if you, you tag the bare minimum, one for the skull, one for the cape, one for the back skin, you've done 10 trophies times three tags. That's 30 tags that you've handwritten. It's a pain. Now, I'm also asking you guys to go and fill out your hunting register every night. That's more admin. The PHs are going to think that all they're doing is homework every night. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get PTSD. That it's, I'm back at school. Write one name per client. Mm. So... His name is either Robert throughout or Rob throughout. Don't on one animal write Rob and the next one write Robert. Because when we come to collecting it, there could have been two Robs in camp. Yeah. So write Robert Smith. Hmm. And that becomes the name that is used on his tags all the way through his safari. It's, a, it, it's, it's common sense. It's simple. But it makes a big difference when it comes to us collecting the trophies, bringing them into studio, making sure that our inventories are correct. It, uh, just out of interest, sake, how, 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 do you guys keep those tags on through the whole process? Or All the you, way through. Really? All the through way through. Through dipping and... Through dipping, through packing. When we receive trophies, we put a second company tag on every single part of every single trophy. So that piece of paper that we see when we walk through the the showroom yeah, with, with the client's details on and stuff. When does that get added once the mounting process That's starts? once the mount, mounting process gets started. Okay. That's for the artists to understand exactly what the requirements are of the client when it comes to the artwork. Okay. Doug, on, on, the, on the previous episode, we touched a little bit on skinning full, full capes. and Is that something you recommend that PHs do a little bit more often than not? Because I've... I've fallen trapped to this as well, is that you don't, on a shoulder mount, you often don't take enough skin off or leave enough skin on for pedestals and that sort of stuff. Sure. So in general, would you recommend that we kind of skin full cape from now on? If there's any indecision as to what the final pose will be, skin it for a full mount. I think on a Nyala, as default, Nyala, skin them, just skin it for a full mount. Yeah. Because how many times clients get back home and they think to themselves, man, that Nyala was magnificent. Mm. I wish I'd full mounted it. So by skinning it for a full mount up front, we are prepared for everything thereafter. Okay. But that's not to say that you should skin the kudu for a full mount. Yeah. It's, it's less common. Speak to the clients throughout about the poses and what they want to do with the trophies after. Is this something that you want a full mount of? Yes, there's a possibility. Then you're going to cape it for a full mount. Is this something that you might want a pedestal or shoulder mount? Oh, I'm not sure. Fine. I'm going to cape it far back, which means we can do a pedestal or a shoulder mount. As rule of thumb, I would still always cape from the midriff back more towards the back legs than the front legs when it comes to caping for a shoulder mount of any form, because then we can do a pedestal, wall pedestal, or shoulder mount. Doug, on, on, on the shoulder mounts, what, what, is, what is the common problem you guys pick up uh, when mounting certain animals? I know um, on the smaller game, I actually, I think a couple of years ago when Warwick took me around, we, we, there was a lot of big calibers used on very small animals. So mm -hmm. the, the, the patches on them were, were quite big, but you guys have done an incredible job of hiding that. But what is the biggest issue that you guys have from mounting these sort of animals from from trophy prep. You know what, if, if you're gonna use a seven mil and shoot a Steinbuck, mm. it's gonna blow the shoulder out. <laughs> yeah. You shoot a Springbuck through the neck, it's only gonna have half a neck. Mm. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Shoot behind the shoulder. Put the bullet behind the shoulder and invariably we can do a lot to hide that bullet hole. Yeah. Unfortunately, with the calibers we're dealing with and the speeds of these rounds, the impact and exit of these rounds, it, it can be quite severe. Mm. 
But that said, I'd rather have that than an animal that's not killed cleanly. Mm. So we have the means. We've got incredible artists mm. that they've got, they've got proper ninja skills when it comes to hiding that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. And the one of the other things that I've I've picked up, not taxidermy done by you guys, but the jagged cut lines behind the the neck. Is there a way that we can prevent that as a professional answer? Absolutely. Good quality knives. So not good, cutting off the seam of the... Good gantry. Okay. If your skinner has to struggle to get that knife around the corner, it's going to be hard. Hang the trophy up. Get it up. The gravity will pull the head down and that will straighten the back of the neck. And you can run your, your blade either if some guys like running it in the middle of the cape or right next to the edge of that, mm. uh, sorry, not the, the cape, down the middle of the mane, mane yeah. or next to the, the edge of the mane. Okay. Are you guys still stitching the manes or are you guys gluing them at the moment? Still stitching. Stitch. Yeah. Okay. Um, Doug, so can you explain to us the difference between dip and pack? At, well, what is the preparation for that, um, for exporting of the dip and pack? Because I'll be honest with you, my, <laughs> my first impression was that you guys actually tan the skins, but... No. You wet mount? No. Yeah. We, we wet mount here. We okay. tan to a wet skin. And then that goes into taxidermy. <clears throat> the dip and pack goes through treatment to eradicate all natural bloods, tissues, um, any, let's call it, wet material left in the animal. And we also remove all the bacteria. And we do this by putting it through a set of treatments that make sure that we don't transfer any bacteria in the process of sending it back to the United States. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if the dip and pack is done well, the trophy also stores well, which means it will travel back to the US and the taxidermists in the US are able to do a really good job on that trophy for the clients. Again, the outcome that we're looking for is a happy hunter with a great experience. Splitting image taxidermy does a lot of dip and pack for for other taxidermists because they know that the standard of our dip and pack is exceptional. The skulls aren't overboiled, the skins are cleaned and they are prepared in such a way that when they get to the States and go into tanning that the hair is still in good condition. Because mm -hmm. I mean that that for me will probably be one of the most important that transition from once you guys are finished with the dip and pack to it actually arrives on that uh, taxidermist doorstep. Once it leaves the country mm -hmm. <clears throat> what is there is there any care or thing that you know, care process that we need to follow on those specific trophies once they get to the states on mounted mounted trophies no no dip and pack unfortunately there's not much we can do to assist once it leaves mm -hmm. our facility because i do know there are certain tanneries when they receive the skins the skins are thrown into the corner they're left on the floor yeah you yeah. know um, not everyone has the same racking privileges that we do mm -hmm. at Splitting Image. I mean, we, we've got massive rack rooms where the skins are all off the floor, air flows freely. We turn our skins literally once a month. Every skin in our storeroom gets turned over and flipped once a month. All those skins? All those skins. Because we don't want any moisture connect, collecting on a lower surface of a skin. And there's always an element of salt in the skins, and salt is hydroscopic. So if there's any moisture in the air, it would attract it to that point. And then what will happen just out of interest? It gives you dead spots in the skin. It can lead to hair slip. It can lead to uh, brittle skins tearing in the future. So, so we spend a lot of time and, and money on making sure that those skins yeah, are well. Can imagine. Out. But so, so what, 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 what is hair slip? We often, yeah, I actually, to be honest with you, I don't understand the phrase. But you hear it thrown around this industry all the time. So what is actual hair slip? Uh, how do I put this in the simplest way possible? Bacteria gets into the skin, eats the follicle of the skin, the hair falls out. And if you don't oh. salt the skin properly, it leaves moisture in the skin and the blood and the tissue that is left in the skin is basically the food for bacteria. And salt kills the bacteria. And salt dries that out and takes the moisture away. It takes the t that, that blood out the skin. Um, and therein lies one of the causes of hair slip. Another one is bullet shock. 
So a bullet blowing through a skin, it bruises the skin. That bruising of the skin causes decay in the hair follicle, and that can cause hair slip as well. Jeez. Doug, <laughs> yes, that's crazy. So I actually, to be honest with you, I thought it was the heat uh, from the skin that, anyway. So, bas so basically, you know, you're, you're actually right. So if you don't get the skin off the carcass as quickly as humanly possible and get it into a stable state, which is in salt, that skin is going to warm up. The blood is going to set into that skin. Bacteria feeds on that blood. You want to get, you want to get that skin away. You want to get it into the salt. You want to get it dried. That's what that, the cleaning and the drying and the salting of the skin is the prevention of any decay down the way. Doug, from, from a species per perspective, there's one that comes to mind, and I'll chat about it a little bit later, but is there, is there anyone that, that, that you can think of at this point that needs a little bit of different care, if I could say, than, than your usual planes game? I mean, I know, for instance, in the species I was thinking about is clip springer. Absolutely. As a professional hunter, there's, there's I mean, there's thousands of different theories depends who you talk to they'll mm. always tell you they've got the best theory what is the best ideal way to handle a clip springer a lot of different ways all of the ways of handling a clip springer should involve a cooler box okay done big cooler box and when you shoot that animal get the gut out i like the icing method mm. honestly get that animal bedded into ice done as soon as you get back to the skinny shed Skin it, clean it thoroughly. I like using a brine solution. It's a, a, a Dettol or Savlon mixture with salt water. Um, that kills out the bacteria very quickly. And then clean salt. Go back to the same principles. Clean salt looks after skins. So, and, and no other species you can think of that will come with a little bit of a unique... Giraffe. As oh, big yeah. as giraffe the are, big thick skin stuff. Big thick skin stuff. Mm -hmm. You need to get in there. You need to dice that fat so that the salt penetrates into the skin. That's difficult. Down the mane of sable, down the mane of zebra, you've got that fat layer. Mm. Get in there, cut it out, dice it out, get the salt in. And when I say salt, we always teach the guys. We have a lot of youngsters that come here, young PHs, and they say, "How should we salt? Can you teach us?" Yeah. Uh, we often bring in their trackers and their skinners and we help them and teach their, their staff. You don't just sprinkle salt on it. We're not gardening. Take that salt and you rub it into the skin. Mm -hmm. Actually apply it, grind it into the skin. If you do that, you get a much higher success rate. Just, okay. So you just rub it in all rub it to in. the nicks and crabbies, the that, ears. That's him. Inside the lips, inside the eyes. Make sure you don't fold over the head and forget to put under the chin. Another, another thing that, that I find has become part of my importance, again, paperwork, is measurements. Mm -hmm. Once that animal, ha, ha, what, what sort of species would you, I know there was, there were eelin that we, we've spoken mm -hmm. about, um, kudu was another one, all these animals that come into rat with the big puffy necks. Yeah. What, what, are, what are other animals and, and where would you recommend that we actually take measurements from? I've always just used the neck. Is there any other way we can... Not really. The neck, the neck is your primary area. Okay. Um, neck, i tell you what else you can look for a good measurement is, is kind of just the, the three different, different positions on the neck. Just in front of the shoulder, mid-neck, just behind the chin. You give me those three measurements. If you do want to get particular about it, you shoot a bull that's got an, ex, an extremely <laughs> over-swollen neck. Yeah. If you give me those measurements, it works really well. And then, Doug, just, just another one on the measurement side of things. Um, I, get, I get asked this question a lot, and especially as I started advertising a green hunt that's become available. When it comes to the rhinos, I know it's a controversial topic, but I just want to touch on it quickly because I think it's important for professional hunters to understand this. What sort of measurements, because you guys do do fiber class mm -hmm. mounts here, what sort of measurements is extremely important for that sort of preparation? Info at splittingimagetaxidermy.co.za. Drop us an email and we'll send you a, a very basic printout 
on where to measure and how to measure specifically for that. Um, okay. It's really not difficult. There's a couple of basics. Um, photographs are very important. Mm -hmm. Side profile photographs, front profile photograph, and then a profi profile photograph from on top of the horn. That gives us an idea of what we're dealing with to create the replica horn. There's very little difference I say there's very little. There's not a not a huge variation in size in in adult bull rhinos. So we have, I think we have three different sizes of molds that we can apply. But based upon the size of the the horn, and you would have a horn measurement around the base of the front horn. Based upon that, we can extrapolate that into the breadth of the head of the rhino, and therefore the size of the body of the of the replica. And so. You, you mentioned photos. I've seen, when you walk through here, there's photos on every animal. Yeah, that, yeah. everywhere. How, how important is that? Critical. Do, you, do your artists use that to... With every single mount. Really? Absolutely. We can see the, the lay of the hair. We can identify the animal's interesting points. The black wildebeest that's got the long whiskers or the long eyelashes. Um, the roan that's, that's got long puffy hairs on the end of the of the ears um, all of those little those little aspects make it make for interesting art and it, it gives us the opportunity to produce something that's exceptional rather than average so more so now than ever before photography art in the bush has become important especially for you guys absolutely absolutely and to be honest there's no reason we can't take good photographs yeah um, cameras are on every single mobile device we've got they all advertise the higher resolutions. And I know guys that buy these fancy phones just because of the cameras. I'm one of them. Oh, 100%. <laughs> me too. You know, take yeah. the photograph. It also gives you the opportunity that you can WhatsApp that through to the company mm -hmm. and send that through to Splitting Image Taxidermy. We keep it on file so that when we do do the work, we've got reference immediately. And, that, and then your <coughs> artistries, they base everything off of that, that photo, yeah. which is it's, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. So, Doug... In short, um, if, there's are, if there are any fancy ways of skinning, like, like we mentioned in the last episode with the African zebra thing, mm -hmm. you guys have got all the diagrams and splitting images. Drop us an email. email. We'll send it through to you. Um, yeah, we'd love to help. And as far as skinning and, and making sure that the, the outfitter and the professional hunter are prepared, would you recommend that clients maybe have a look at your guys' website beforehand? For sure get a better idea of how they want their animals done. and Look at our social media feeds, Instagram. I know we've, we've got a good page and we've got a really good team that keeps that updated. Um, our website is it's a thorough site and you can find pretty much everything you need to know about our services and options on the website itself. Okay. And then once the clients check out at the lodge, you guys collect and then it goes into the whole process. Absolutely. And if we have time while you're in camp and they want to visit the studio, please come to the studio. Uh, it's not about coming to the showroom. Mm. We want we want the guys to come into the workshop, into the workspace, to see other clients' work being done, mm. the real thing. Um, if you can't get into, into the studio, we've also got guys that go out to the camps and go and meet folks in the camps. Mm and discuss taxidermy options. I'm, I spend a lot of time traveling. I'm constantly out in the lodges. I love meeting hunters from all over the world. Um, if you're going to invest in me, I'm going to invest the time in you. Yeah. Well, Doug, once again, thank you so much. It's been an incredible podcast. I love the, the info. Yeah, it it's helps. good fun, huh? It helps us so much. So, um, yeah, thank you. And then, yeah, look forward to the next couple of ones we're going to be doing. Really, it mean, means it means the world to me. And I'm sure a lot of guys will benefit of, of this great information. Absolutely. If there's ever any questions, the guys can reach out to you, can reach out to Splitting Image Taxidermy. Always, always happy to help. Um, yeah, we're very lucky to be where we are. Doug, thank you so much. Catch Appreciate up to you next time. Thanks. The Journal is brought to you by Treason. Don't just blend, become. Splitting Image Taxidermy. Worth remembering. Maxis Tires. Covering pHs over any terrain. Magnum Archery. Scullies. The little things are what makes life wonderful. Vanandi Blends. Changing the game. FFS Outdoor. Versatile gear for any situation. PH Toolbox. Helping you make your own adventure.